All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. It's good to see you this morning. Good to see some of you again after yesterday. We had a wonderful auction yesterday. Um, I'm Reverend Carol Badeau, privileged to serve Westside as minister. I want to say good morning to all the folks who are watching us on our YouTube or Zoom of this service. Happy to have you here too. So um, this morning, we are um, going to be talking about remembrance and remembering those who have passed. I don't know about you, but for me, this time of year, the fog, the changing colors, the falling leaves, all those things have a tendency to make me a bit melancholy. And it is this time of year that we typically remember those who have passed. So a couple of announcements before we get started. Next week, Morgan Ringelspa will be leading the service on Samhain, Halloween, and there are many different ways we mark that holiday. Feel free to wear costumes. The whole, the whole point of the service is to kind of be to remember magic. So, so feel free to wear costumes next week. Uh, another announcement is some of you have already read this book. This is the ABCs of LGBTQ+. This is a book that some of us read earlier this year and um, had some discussions about in our Thursday evening group, but we are going to have another opportunity for people to read it and discuss it. So if you are interested, uh, we have a couple copies of these that we can loan out to share. December 5th, we'll be talking about the book again in a Zoom session in the afternoon. So um, pay attention to that if you're interested. And also, um, just a last announcement about the church retreat at Pickett State Park. This is, I know many of the people who are here in person already know about this, but if you are watching this um, on our Zoom or watching our YouTube um, re replay of this, we are going to be having our retreat at Pickett State Park the weekend of November 5th, 6th, and 7th. So we have a picnic shelter reserved for all day on the 7th. You can, if you want to find lodging somewhere on the 5th and 6th, that's great. But you can also just come up for the day. If you're interested in that, make sure to let me or the office know so that we can email you details. All right. So we're going to begin with the sounding of the bowl. As the bowl sounds, as I invite it to sound, I invite you to come fully present in this moment. Take a couple deep breaths, feel your feet on the ground, feel your body in this space. Kind of try to draw your attention away from the things that are worrying you or the plans you're making and just be fully present. Today, we remember those who share the earth with us no longer. We bear witness to their lives and the roles they've played in ours. We pay homage to and make stronger that web that connects us all. Nothing Gold Can Stay by Robert Frost. Nature's first green is gold hardest hue to hold, her early leaves of flower, but only so an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf, so even sank to grief. So dawn goes down today, nothing gold can stay. So that passage from youth to middle age, to old age, to death, the shifts 
from initial enthusiasm with a project or a relationship to familiarity or the middle of the project or the middle time of the relationship and and perhaps to a stage that's disappointment or maybe fulfillment and then completion. These stages really are in everything we do, beginnings, middles, crescendos, day crescendos, endings. These are the sometimes gentle and sometimes harsh transitions from spring to summer to fall to winter and back to spring. All of life is a series of such cycles and transitions. We don't actually always pay attention to the cycle though. We're usually so caught up in the stage we're in that we don't necessarily notice that it's part of a cycle until there's a sudden shift. Sometimes those transitions come quietly and sometimes they are just as expected, but other times they're sudden or they're unexpected or abrupt. Sometimes they are grateful and gracious and easy and sometimes they're difficult and filled with struggle and uncertainty. So today, as we think about in particular people whose lives have gone through that full cycle from beginning to middle to completion, we also think about the parts of our lives that do that. So calling to mind individuals who you miss, but also calling to mind the own cycles of your life, whether that's a career that's gone through a cycle or a relationship. We all have many of these in our lives. And one of the things that we often tend to do is not think as much about endings as we do about beginnings, because endings often come with loss. They often come with grief and mourning, and that's something we will sometimes want to avoid. So we, we can be caught unawares when grief and loss arrive because we haven't been preparing ourselves for it. This, this is an excerpt from a poem by Belinda Stotler called Seasons of Grief. Shall I wither and fall like an autumn leaf from this deep sorrow? from this painful grief? How can I go on or find a way to be strong? Will I ever again enjoy life's sweet song? Sometimes a warm memory sheds light in the dark and eases the pain like the song of a meadow lark. Then it flits away on silent wings and I'm alone, hungering for more of the light it had shown. Death is something we like to avoid. We don't really like to sit around and reflect on death. Our culture has a tendency to only allow us to think about death in dramatic, gory, you know, sort of cinema, cinematographic ways, right? We're going to see a whole bunch of that in the next couple of weeks. The next week and a half is going to be filled with acceptable ways of looking at death in our society. I've been watching, you know, I watch a little bit of, um, you know, cable TV once in a while. And right now, if you, if you click on the guide button on your cable TV clicker, what you get is all these awful movies. Okay, great for some of you, awful for me movies, right? Halloween, zombies, the dead people got, like all this stuff, right? We, we have this fascination with the gory and the ugly and with blowing things up and explosions and bombs and craters opening in Los Angeles and, you know, death and destruction, right? We have this fascination with that. But we really don't like to talk about death. And there's a connection between those two things. That fascination is a way of confronting death without really confronting it. It's a way of feeling like we're victors over death. And that is the way we handle Halloween in our culture too, often. But other cultures, older cultures, and contemporary cultures now in our world 
are a little bit more solemn and honoring about the subject of death itself. So while, you know, most of America is celebrating Halloween with the, you know, the gory masks that like you have the little pump that you can like pump the blood through your face mask. I'm sorry, I just can't. That is just too gross for me, right? While we're doing that, there are other cultures that are doing different things. So there are religions in our society. The Catholic Church celebrates, and some of the other Protestant churches celebrate all souls and all saints next week, which is a, a deeper honoring of this time of year, which is a remembrance of those who have passed. And in um, parts of Mexico and parts of the United States where people from those parts of the world come, um, people will be celebrating Dia de los Muertos, which is again, Day of the Dead, honoring of those who have passed. So death is a constant companion in our lives. Every single day, death is with us. In Belinda Stotler's poem, we hear these words that echo the feelings that come when we deal with death death of a loved one, death of something we've had to leave behind. But this next poem by Emily Dickinson that Suzanne and David are gonna read really addresses the matter of thinking about our own mortality. Kind of a, a graceful way of imagining it. Emily Dickinson, titled Because I Could Not Stop for Death. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly drove, he knew no haste, and I had put away my labor and my leisure too for his civility. We passed the school where children strove at recess in the ring. We passed the fields of graze, gazing grain. We passed the setting sun. Or rather, he passed us. The dews drew quivering and chill for only gossamer, my gown, my tippet, only tool. We paused before a house that seemed a swelling in the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground. Since then, Tis centuries, and yet feels shorter than the day I first surmised the horses' heads were toward eternity. So in the last year and a half, death and loss have been very present with us. You know, we've all been aware of the pandemic that has really brought this sense of mortality to us. And, and one of the challenges we have as Unitarian Universalists is we don't have a shared theology about what happens after death. We have a wide range of perspectives about that. There are people in our tradition who are Christian who believe in the Christian traditions of heaven and hell. There are people in our tradition who are pagan, who have very different beliefs about reincarnation or multiple lives. There are people who are atheists, who believe that when we, we die, our bodies return to the earth and that is the end of it. And a whole wide range of other perspectives. So for us, dealing with this issue of mortality is a little bit trickier than it is for people who have very set ideas as a community about what that means. But here's what we do agree upon. 
loss is something worth marking, is something worth paying attention to. And the life of whatever has passed is worth honoring and remembering. So I invite you to take a minute and just take a deep breath and call to mind things that you want to honor, people that you want to honor, places, experiences, stages of your life. Sometimes when we avoid the mourning and the grief and the loss, we don't go as deep into the remembering as we might otherwise do. So let's take a minute to do that. Suzanne's going to light a few candles for us. And Suzanne, I'll invite you to stay with us. We're going to light candles for those Westsiders in particular who have passed since the beginning of the pandemic, if we can get that darn thing to work. I'll tell you what, why don't you read their names around here? That's right. This has been giving us a little trouble. So we're going to light candles for those who have passed in the last couple of years here as, at West Side. Bill Calhoun. Mary Donovan. Sue Draper. Susan Wetling, and Chuck Flanagan. So let's take a moment just to remember the legacies and incredible gifts of those lives. Chuck just passed very recently within the last month and a half. These are people upon whose work and spirits we build the future of this congregation. So we take a moment just to honor them and also take a moment to call to mind and honor all those who we remember in our memorial garden here. This is a space of remembering people whose lives have made this possible for us. This poem is by Reverend Dr. Maya Angelou. She's not a Reverend, Dr. Maya Angelou. I kind of think she should have been called Reverend actually. Does anybody else agree with me on that? Can I, can I get an amen on that? Because she should have been. When great trees fall, when great trees fall, rocks on distant hills shudder, lions hunker down in tall grasses, and even elephants lumber after safety. When great trees fall in forests, small things recoil into silence, their senses eroded beyond fear. When great souls die, the air around us becomes light, rare, sterile, we breathe briefly, our eyes briefly see with a hurtful clarity. Our memory suddenly sharpened, examines, gnaws on kind words unsaid, promised walks never taken. Great souls die and our reality bound to them takes leave of us. Our souls dependent upon their nurture now shrink, wizened. Our minds formed and informed by their radiance fall away. We are not so much maddened as reduced to the unutterable ignorance of dark, cold caves. And when great souls die after a period, peace blooms slowly 
and always irregularly, spaces fill with a kind of soothing electric vibration. Our senses restored, never to be the same, whisper to us, they existed. They existed. We can be, be, and be better, for they existed. Now we're going to read the names of all those souls who you wish to honor today. And we apologize if we have a trouble reading your writing. We'll try to get these correct. Dan Roy, Chris Norris, Darwin Cook. Walter Downs, Emmy Downs. Chuck Flanagan, Kenneth McKinnon. Mary Polinski, Harold Howell, Hilda Howell, Roy Howell, Wayne Howell, and Elizabeth Howell. Carol Lindsay, Mary Donovan, Sue Draper, Wilton Lindsay, Sam and Miriam Levering, Patty Levering, Charlie Kern, Anna Serban, Doris Holdeman. Jonas Holdeman, the father of our Jonas, and Verna Burdia. Victoria. Tilly, Rita, Florence, Leon, Leslie, Pam, Ruth, Marge, and all of the 13 deceased dogs from that family. William Ray Paul, Raymond Paul. Oceana Paul, Oceana Paul, sorry. Marion, Mabel, Maggie the dog, and Charles. Ernie Grob, Claire Grob, Fred Murray Murphy, Lavandus Blackman, Micah Wong. Cliff Shumpert, Tom and Bertie Shumpert, Lorraine and Byron Payne, and Berkey. Tesler Yeager. Eveline Moss, Chester Moss, again, Sue Draper and Mary Donovan, Cliff Nunley, Anne Heatherly, and Vic Vaughn. This is Do Not Stand at My Grave and Weep by Mary Elizabeth Fry. Do not stand at my grave and weep I am not there, I do not sleep. I am a thousand winds that blow. I'm the diamond glints on snow. I'm the sun on ripened grain. I'm the gentle autumn rain. When you awaken in the morning's hush, I am the swift uplifting rush of sweet Quiet birds in circled flight. I am the soft stars that shine at night. 
Do not stand at my grave and cry. I am not there. I did not do it. Suzanne and David and I were talking for a brief moment before the service started about the last line of that poem. It's an excellent line for us to reflect on what we think about death. For some people, that line means literally that the person didn't actually die, that they ascended or went to some other place. For some people, it means they've become part of nature, part of the earth's ever turning seasons and cycles. For other people, it means that they live on in us, in our ability to appreciate beauty, in our ability to give life meaning through our own lives. We hold very different theologies together as a community. I invite us to take just another moment and ask the question, how do we go forward knowing that death is inevitable? How does it shape our lives? We often look at other people's theologies about death and they don't make sense to us. Now that's true of, for example, a denomination where everyone agrees on what death means. They might look at other people's beliefs and all together collectively say that's crazy. Often in our Unitarian Universalist communities, we look at each other and say that, right? But here's something that is always true and mostly unacknowledged. What we believe about death profoundly shapes how we make our choices every day. Regardless of what that belief is, our beliefs and our core theology, our core religious spiritual thinking about what death is determines how we live our lives. We don't necessarily always draw the lines back from our choices to that, but I guarantee you that they always ultimately go back to that. So ask yourself today, how does what you believe about the nature of death shape your living? For some people, it can cause hopelessness, despair, and a sense of wanting to give up, a sort of pointlessness when they think about death. I've heard some people say, what's the point? My life doesn't matter. Like, I'm a speck in the cosmic thing that is the universe, right? My life doesn't make that much difference. But I would argue that regardless of what we actually believe about what happens after we die, our lives matter. Our living matters. Every act that we perform, every word we say, every smile we offer, these things matter. We don't do it single-handedly. You know, there are a thousand metaphors for this, right? Drops in the ocean, bricks in the building, you know, pick your your metaphor, right? Collectively, it does matter. So I would hope that together as a community, we can be people who, regardless of our beliefs about death, choose to use our lives to leave legacies of beauty, strength, courage, commitment, peace, honoring that which has come before and wishing the best for what will come after us. Many that we have loved have left behind this physical place, but we know that they remain alive in our hearts and our minds and in the very fact that we exist. We give voice to the wisdom they shared. We give body to the energy of their passions and we give action 
to the dreams of their lives. And we pass this wisdom, this passion, and these dreams on to those who follow us. Even now, death is our companion, but in a sense, pick your interpretation of that line, in a sense, we do not die because we leave behind the legacy of our lives. Let us, like those we remember today, make them count. I'm going to extinguish the chalice and those candles as a, a way to kind of help us remember that our individual lives do go out, but that spirit is carried with us in our hearts, in the conversations you will have during coffee hour on Zoom, talking to each other here, you know, when you go out to lunch later with friends or family, people you'll see this week, even as these individual lights go out, all of that love, that spirit, that sacredness goes with us. Go in peace.